gear. I could play it on a CD while I'm driving the car. <laughs> Leno's Garage, the car featuring today, my 2004 Porsche Carrera GT. I, I can't believe I've had this thing almost 17 years, and we haven't done it yet. You know, we've used it on the, the CNBC show, and we went to Talladega. I'll get into that in a little bit. But anyway, here we are. I'm glad to say we have not our full crew back, but we're meeting all the COVID guidelines and everybody wears a mask and you got to stay six feet apart and we get tested every day. So make sure our crew is safe. This is, I know it's taken quite a while to get to this point, but it's well worth it. Uh, everybody has remained safe and well, and that's, that's important. Okay, let's go back to uh, the car. Interesting, this has become a legendary car. When they came out, they're about $440,000. And then I would say in the uh, 20, 10, 12, 13, they dropped into the $200,000 range, and now they're back being million dollar cars again. Uh, not again, uh, for the first time. It, it, this is a unique car, V10, 5.7 liters, 603 horsepower. I realize in today's market, 600 horsepower doesn't sound like a whole lot, but this thing only weighs 3,000 pounds, and it is the greatest sounding engine of just about any car. Uh, you'll, you'll hear that in a minute. We we put some special microphones on the exhaust pipe so you can hear it. It's such, such a fun car to drive. Uh, I, I think you probably know the story of these, uh, how it was originally, the engine was developed for racing at Le Mans, and uh, well, that whole thing went away, and they, what are we gonna do with this? And in 2000, they revealed a show car using the engine, and then in 2004, it came out with this. Like, it is the last analog Porsche. Uh, there's no uh, stability control on it. It's a uh, six speed and it's famous for its engineering, its ceramic clutch. Uh, the clutch is, it was just a little over 6.7 inches, just about that big. And I remember I, I was so astounded by it. I called Porsche and I said, could you send me one of the clutches? And they sent me one of the clutches and we all looked at it here at the shop and thought, this is pretty amazing. I should get the rest of the pieces that go with it because I was just so amazed at the clutch. It was amazing they could transmit that much, that much uh, horsepower. Plus, it allowed them to lower the car. This car is, was 3.9 inches off the ground. Yeah, it's very low. In fact, when I got it, every time I went to a gas station or a speed, I'd hear <laughs> You just scrape everything, you know? So I called Porsche and they said, we have a lift kit that will raise it about a quarter of an inch. So now instead of going <laughs> it goes it just scrapes a little high, a little less, but you can still hear it. But it's not as bad as it was. You know, it's interesting. I, I kind of fell in and out of love with this car because when I got it, uh, I was doing a TV show, another thing. I didn't get to drive it a whole lot, but I really enjoyed it. Then after about two and a half years, I'd be on the freeway and it, it would kind of jump from lane to lane. I couldn't figure what I, what's going on with this thing. I didn't have an accident. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't figure out what was wrong. And then I parked it. I, I, I used other cars for a while. I would still take it out. And then I realized, oh, these shocks were gone. And I put, uh, went to Porsche, uh, put brand new shocks on it, and it just transformed the car. I mean, for some reason, there was a problem with it initially that I just, we just didn't diagnose because I'd never driven one. And now I love this thing. It's, it's fantastic. It's just a wonderful, wonderful car. Let me come around, open the hood for you. You've got an electronic switch here. Okay. Well, there you have it. As I said, V10, 5.7 liter. Just a beautiful engine bay and engine compartment. Look at all this carbon fiber here. Very stiff chassis. You know, it's interesting. When I pull this out of the driveway, this is the only car I have where you'll have three wheels up and one wheel this way because it doesn't flex at all. It actually has one wheel off the ground. Uh, I can't say I've had any problem with this. You know, I would hear people complain, not so much the magazine writers, but uh, when they first came out, people didn't like the clutch. You know, read the directions. I read about one guy in San Francisco who's burned his clutch out in the first couple of days with the hills and everything. The way you drive this car is you get in, you start it up, you put it in gear, 
you take your foot off the clutch without touching the throttle. Once it engages, nail the throttle and you're fine. You can do burnouts all day with it if you want, if you do it that way. If you try to slip it, where you're just gonna burn out that little clutch and that's like a twenty or thirty thousand dollar job. But this one is fine. I had no problems with it. Uh, it's just been fantastic. It is truly a fascinating car to drive. Boy, it feels like a lot more than 603 horsepower. Even after driving some of the other cars I have, the Ford GT or the P1 McLaren, there's, there's something about this sound that is so intoxicating. I mean, it really is a sensory overload driving this. Just a wonderful, wonderful car to drive. There's such passion in the design and building of this Porsche. You know, we always think of uh, the Italians as having the passion for the cars and the Germans, yes, most exactly. Uh, but this, this, this is the perfect combination of German technology and engineering with passion. If you've read any of the books on the Courier GT and the design team and the, the folks who built it, it's, uh, it, 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 it's, it's pretty fascinating. And it's a unique engine that has never been used in anything else. I guess we have the Cayman to thank for this. You know, when Porsche started doing SUVs and four-door sedans, people went, oh, well, that's the end of Porsche. Actually, that was the savior of the company. It, there's only so many two-seater sports cars you can sell. So you've got to broaden your market. And all the money made from selling those cars helped to make this car and, of course, all subsequent cars, cars after that. So you've got to have your bread and butter cars to help build and maintain these things. So, I mean, just the way the suspension is set up is... is uh, we've got double wishbones with spring shock absorber units. These are operated by push rods, as you can see, with a stabilizer or anti-roll bar, if you want to call it that. You've got straight wound coil springs at each wheel with gas-filled shock absorbers. Those are mounted coaxially uh, inside. Take a look. The front, uh, double wishbone with spring shock absorber units. Those are operated by push rods. Same thing. And you've got power-assisted rack and pinion steering. If you're wondering what this flashing light is here, that's our SeaTech uh, trickle charger. SeaTech is really the best, I, I find. I use them on all my cars uh, because they're the ones the manufacturers use. The Porsche uses SeaTech, Ferrari, for everybody uh, because they don't over, you know, sometimes you go to some big box store and you buy that, oh, look, here's a Chinese made uh, uh, trickle charger for half the price. Well, there's a reason it's half the price is because they usually wind up boiling the battery. You know, a problem I had with this car when I first got it, I take it out on the road, I throw it into a corner, and whoa, it sounded like the engine cut out. What was that? Yeah. I'm trying to figure out what it was. And then one day it just stopped. Okay, and we flatbedded it back here, and we couldn't figure out what it was. I said, well, maybe it's losing power. Are we sure the battery's connected? I'm sure. Well, let's so to take, to take the battery out of this thing, you got to pull the wheel off and get a new. Well, what had happened was somebody at the factory or whenever when I got it just didn't tighten it enough. And it was one of those deals where the battery, when, it, when, when you shifted the car violently, it would literally lift off the battery terminal and then just go back on and lift off. So once we fixed that, then the car was perfect. It's just one of those stupid little things that can knock you right out of the box. But, I mean, I'm still mad that I had to flatbed it for that, but there's no way I could have tightened that on the road anyway. So the wheel had to come off, he had to get underneath it. One of the pitfalls of having an extremely complicated car with a very, very simple problem. You know, if it was my 63 Ford Falcon, I opened the hood, well, there you go, right there. Yeah, there you go. You know, all I mentioned about the clutch before, there's something I found out was interesting. I think Tilton was, uh, which is an American manufacturer, uh, owned the patent that had something to do with the clutch on this. So I like that American connection because well, anytime my cars have an American connection, I think that's kind of cool. All right, let's shut this hood again. And we'll come around and we'll show you the front. Tires of Michelin Pilot Super Sports. I'm told that this Michelin tire was developed specifically for this car, but it does make a, a, a heck of a difference. I mean, Michelin tires are unbelievable. They really are the best. Uh, you notice you've got these center lock wheels. These are uh, forged magnesium center lock wheels. Red on this side, blue on the other, because one's a right-hand thread, one's a left-hand thread. That's so you don't get them screwed up. And you've got your lock right in there. You've got 19s in the front, you've got 20s in the back. The brakes right here, as you can see, pretty massive. Dual circuit, ABS, six-piston, monoblock, alloy calipers. Uh, you've got the composite ceramic brake discs. Uh, they're pretty neat, hydraulic booster servo, the whole deal. Uh, 
the car stops and handles pretty amazingly. All right, let's take a look at the interior. Notice is it's just a regular door, no dopey thing that comes out and goes sideways and you turn it. You just open the door this way. Uh, something that's kind of fun. You got a little hidden compartment here. Maybe a lot of owners don't like to show that, but and it comes with a little leather thing. You can put leather, whatever, whatever you put in a leather bag. I don't know. If you put it in there. I don't put anything in there. But I suppose you. There you go. So, so. But now when cops stop you, if you got one, you say, hey, "Open that uh, door there." Uh, this has got the terracotta interior, which I really like. I think it's really attractive. Wonderful to get in when the top is off. Horrible to get in when the top is off. I never put the top in in this car. The top is in the front. I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, very comfortable place to be. Classic Porsche instrument with your tachometer right in the center. Water temperature because it's water cooled, obviously. Uh, speedo, all the gauges, fuel, whatever. And of course, the famous balsa wood shift knob, which is. I guess you could also get uh, carbon fiber. I like the wood because it harkens back to the 917, which also had it. I love it up here. You know, my favorite thing about early Alfa Romeos was that high uh, gear shift, you know. It was high up uh, the early Alfa Spiders and the Julias and all that. And that was, that was a five-speed, which seemed so exotic when I was a kid, because when you bought a Mustang or a Corvette, Standard transmission is a three-speed. Then you go to a four-speed, or you can get the automatic. Uh, and you've got beautiful leather interior, nice stereo, CD player. Remember those? Because this is really the last days of the old technology. It's the last, as I said, analog Porsche. And I think that's what makes it so attractive. And I love the fact that they developed a transmission and a special clutch just for this car. You know, Porsche doesn't go into the parts bin. What have we got left over? Okay, let's put something together and call it a car. I mean, this was built out of passion, out of design. You know, it's, it's funny. I, it, I, to me, I think it's a beautiful looking car. I, I've never seen um, a German car that's sort of over the top. That's more for us Americans or the Italians. It's always form follows function. It's always understated. <laughs> The car is always better than and faster than whatever Porsche said it is. And that's interesting to me. You know, Porsche will say, oh, it's 3.6. Then you get one, they go, oh, no, it's 3.2. David Donahue and I went to uh, Florida. And why Porsche asked me to do this, I have no idea. But we were going to set some speed records with the Carrera GT. Why you would ask a aging comedian to do that, I don't know. But it was a great thrill, a great honor. And we were lapping Talladega about 190. And I was coming down the back straight. And one thing you don't do at those speeds, you know, it's interesting. It was the first time I'd ever driven 200 miles an hour. And I didn't hit 200 in this, high, high 190s. Uh, but after about 25 or 50 laps at that speed, you know, it's all very sensitive. You, you can feel the tires start to uh, lose traction a little bit, and they, whoa, it's, it's just starting to do this a little bit in, the, in those high speed banking. You know, the banking is so, uh, you, you can't really walk up it, you almost have to get on your hands and knees. And anyway, it's just sort of doing this. We'd show you the footage, but we can't afford it because it doesn't belong to me, it belongs to somebody else to license it. But if you go to Google on YouTube and Leno Talladega Porsche, uh, it'll show you the spin out. Anyway, I was coming down the back straight. A couple of articles said this happened in the corner. It didn't happen in the corner. And I was coming that back straight, and I saw the guy, and the guy gave me one of these. That's good. I said, oh, great. And like an idiot, I just lifted my foot a little bit off the throttle, and the rear end came around, and we spun about five or eight times down the center of the track. Now, I always remember race car drivers saying, you're going to hit what you're looking at. So as we started to spin, I saw the wall. So I immediately turned my head, which made me cut the wheel. Then we saw the wall, and that's how I cut the wheel. The other. So I managed to just spin down the center of the track. Just, mm, but we flat spotted all four tires. Just all four tires were ruined instantly. Didn't hit anything, didn't damage the car. But to spin out at 191 is, 
it was an interesting experience. Uh, all the Porsche, Norbert Singer was there, the, the legendary tuner and suspension man from Porsche. I mean, it was an honor to meet him. And this was the fastest Porsche ever developed up to that point. I mean, it's amazing how quickly technology moves. I mean, I realize that's almost 20 years ago, which is a long time, but not when you're, not when you're my age. And cars have gotten so amazingly fast and horsepower and everything else. But uh, it was really a thrilling experience to drive this thing at that speed. And to hear that engine note, to be redlining in fifth gear or fourth gear, more so, uh, it was really fascinating. Uh, the red line on this thing is about 8,100, 8,200, and to be going 190 and see the needle moving into the red, that's, uh, that was pretty cool. But it's really a matter of just holding the wheel like this. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you, you just sort of, <laughs> you know, no, no quick moves uh, because this back end will come around. And this car had gotten a reputation as sort of a Widowmaker type of thing, James Dean type of thing. I remember when Paul Walker had his accident, uh, there were people going to sue Porsche and their lawyers would call me and I would say, no, it's because they had seen me spin out. And I said, no, it was my fault. It was not Porsche's fault. Porsche, they said, oh, well, I didn't have stability control. Well, first of all, most people turn it off. And second of all, they didn't deem it was necessary trying to make the car as light as possible. And this car is, well, it's like, you know, you should know how to, you should, I guess it's personal responsibility. You know, uh, and I gave my testimony in favor of Porsche because I believe they were correct. You know, you, you get some lawyers. Oh, for the for just a 29 cent part, they could have said, "Well, no, that wasn't the case with with this car. This is a purpose-built car. Uh, you shouldn't drive it unless you're skilled and you know what you're doing." And mine was a classic case of driver error coming down that straight. I just lifted my foot off a little too soon, a little too quickly, and whoosh, just made the car just spin. I mean, I might have been a, a little bit of a coming off the banking, that might have contributed to it, but we just, we'll take a look at it. You see the car just, just curly cue down the track, and I drove it back into the pits. It was fine, as I said, the tires were dun -dun, dun -dun, dun -dun. It was a set of tires, but I didn't damage the car, and I didn't damage myself, so that, that was good. So. I, I guess I should thank Porsche for saving me because of my stupid driver error. That's pretty much the story on that. Let's, uh, let's take a look at the front and I'll show, you, uh, I'll show you where the roof goes. There's no way to get out of this gracefully. You have another switch down here. As you can see, you have your roof goes in these bags and it stacks in here. If you take the roof off, there is no trunk space at all. You may be able to carry a Pez dispenser with one extra Pez, but that's about it. If you don't know what Pez is, it's just a candy. Uh, here is your, I love the fact that they give you your own special wrench to take the wheels off, but they don't, there's no, they don't give you the pry bar. Yeah, so I guess I don't know the way you're supposed to come up with that, but uh, this is it here. See that, that grips right on, let you take the wheel off. I could take this out and put the roof on, but then it'd be, ugh, then I'd have to put it back in there. I only took this, I only put the roof on once. I took my wife for a ride, and this is a cost, ow, my hair kind of, this is the ultimate ow, my hair kind of car. So I had to pull over and put the roof on, and then it was okay. But it's such a different car with the roof on. It, it seems claustrophobic, and you can't really see out the back. And of course, to get in, you got to do that. So with the roof off, it's, it's just glorious. It's, it's the most wonderful sounding car. Well, you're going to hear it in just a minute. And uh, well, let's show you what I'm talking about. Let's go for a ride. <laughs> up to this point, and yet, 
It is so like what Porsche is all about. It's emotional, it makes all the right noises, yet it's not really like any other Porsche they ever built. But it sort of follows the Porsche ethos of science and artistry and passion. Oh, it's just fantastic. Oh, I love this thing. You know, I don't believe there's any aftermarket exhaust system you could put on this car to make it sound better. They might make it sound louder, but it won't sound, sound better. It, it, it strikes just exactly the right tone. Not obnoxious, you know, you're not getting the neighbors yelling and screaming, but it just, ah, oh, symphony orchestra. It's a classic example of a tuned exhaust system. You know, somebody worked just hundreds of hours to get this just right. See, this is what I love about this, because this is the job I always wanted. It looks like you're working, but you're not really working, you're just driving cars. And it's perfect. You know, if you can find a job that's also your hobby, ah, there's nothing better in the world. I have so many friends, they go to work and they hate it, you know, and I go, oh, well, I'm not really going to work, I'm going to my garage. Oh, that's right, I guess that's work. This thing has got something like, I think it's 10 oil pumps, just to make sure oil is going everywhere it's supposed to. Visibility is excellent. Uh, you can see out the rear view mirror with the top off, just fantastic. I know the PDK is faster, but to me, there's nothing like grabbing this shift and just moving it. You just feel like you're in such control of the car. It's doing exactly what you want, even if it's not faster. At least I get to pick the gear I'm in. I like Once you get out on the road, up into the hills like where we're going, ah, the kind of coffee up here. You know, they were originally supposed to build, I guess, 1,500 of these. I think they stopped at 1,290, uh, at least for the American market. I think that's what it was. You know, the middle 2000s were a pretty good year for supercars. You had the, the Ford GT, the first generation, come out. You had the SLR uh, McLaren Mercedes, and you had this Porsche Carrera, so there was a lot of choices to be made. The one that really surprised everybody, I think, was the Ford GT. Nobody expected it to be that good, especially Jeremy Clarkson. I think he actually bought one. But this one... of workmanship. 
much torque in every gear. Because there's so much composite, the car is so light. 600 horsepower actually feels like a lot more. You gotta remember back in 2004, that was unbelievable. Hope you enjoyed this ride, the Carrera GT. You know, it's funny that they've become a, it's become a classic in such a short period of time. But anyway, I just want to give you a taste of it, a feel of it, and it's fun to have my crew back. So it should sound better and look better too. A lot of better. It's not me holding a cell phone. So <laughs> welcome back and thanks for sticking with us through most of that pandemic. Mm-hmm. <laughs>